Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Katie Smoller. I'm the Director of Educational Programs here at the National History Academy. We want to thank you for joining us in our National Hispanic Heritage Month uh, virtual programming. And today we are fortunate enough to be virtually visiting with Palo Alto Battlefield National Historical Park. And we are with the Chief of Interpretation, Daniel Ibarra, and the Park Guide, Ruben Reyna. So Daniel and Ruben, thank you so much for being with us today. Awesome, uh, thanks for having us. Um, Ruben's slightly off camera right now, working, working the IT scene. Uh, I'm here, uh, luckily and very happily joined by one of our park volunteers, uh, Jaime Hernandez. This is one of our living historians, a uh, big part of our program here. Uh, and so what we're gonna do right now is, is watch a short video, kind of give you a, a brief overview of our site and its importance. Uh, and then you'll be coming back to us and joining us as we get into a little bit more in-depth discussion on the U.S.-Mexican War and its uh, impact or influence on uh, Hispanic heritage. Hello, and welcome to Palo Alto Battlefield National Historical Park. You are at the site of the first battle of the U.S.-Mexican War, the Battle of Palo Alto. You're also at the only MPS site that interprets the U.S.-Mexican War. Now, inside our visitor center over here, we have plenty of interactive exhibits and a 15-minute video that talks all about the battle and a little bit of the war. You excited to come on in? No, I'm excited. Let's get to it. Hello, my name is Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. In the spring of 1846, all eyes turned towards events on the Rio Grande. When President James K. Polk addressed Congress in December of 1845, he stated, the jurisdiction of the United States has passed the Cape to Florida and peacefully extended to Del Norte. With that statement, President Polk declared the boundary between Texas and Mexico was the Rio Bravo del Norte, also known as the Rio Grande. On December 29, 1845, Polk welcomed the former Republic of Texas into the Union, but the Mexican government asserted Texas was rightfully still a part of their country. Although Texas claimed independence from Mexico in 1836, Mexican leaders never recognized Texas' independence. Questions about the boundary of Texas further complicated matters. When Texas claimed independence from Mexico in 1836, it declared the Rio Grande as their boundary. Mexico viewed Texas as a much smaller region, bordered in part by the Nueces River. The differing views on the boundary left in dispute a huge stretch of land between the two rivers. To make his position clear, President Polk sent an army led by Zachary Taylor to Texas in July, 1845. The seasoned general later advanced to the Rio Grande in March, 1846. Taylor led his troops to the river's edge, setting up camp across from the city of Matamoros. His Mexican counterpart, General Mariano Arista, commander of the Army of the North, arrived in Matamoros at the end of April, 1846. Arista was determined to drive out the U.S. Army as soon as possible. On May 8, 1846, General Taylor and roughly 2,300 U.S. troops faced off against General Arista and approximately 3,500 Mexican soldados. <laughs> Let's head out and take a look at the battlefield. You are standing on the western edge of Palo Alto Battlefield. At this point, you would have had to duck for cover as the cannonballs were whizzing by overhead. Behind me, we have the historic road from Point Isabel to Matamoros, with the Mexican battle line to the south and the U.S. battle line to the north. It would have been typical for the 19th century type of warfare with the artillery uh, and the infantry having smooth war weapons. The artillery cannons would have had a range of 600 to 700 yards and the infantry would have had a range of about 80 to 100 yards. There would only have been two offensive maneuvers from the infantry on this battlefield, so there have been little involvement on their part. In fact, at one point, the U.S. infantry was told to either sit or lay down as the cannonballs bounced by overhead. Let's take a look at the Mexican battle line. 
This long row of flags represented where the 3,500 Mexican troops lined up from east to west in a mile long line. And right here is where they took deadly cannon fire. 18 pound shells bursting overhead, six pound solid shot tearing through the line. Now, right here on this historic road, the Mexicans put their left flank, attempting to make a roadblock to stop Taylor and his troops from reaching the fort on the Rio Grande. Arista wanted Taylor's infantry to advance. Unfortunately, it did not. Instead, Taylor rolled his cannon forward and attacked those deadly, with those deadly balls. It was a five hour cannon duel that Arista and the Mexican troops were not equipped to fight. Let's find out why. Over here, we have a rec replica of a four pound cannon that the Mexican forces used out here. Besides using these, they also used the eight pound cannon. Now this four pound cannon is very heavy for its size is very tough to maneuver on the battlefield. This model is a model that was designed 80 years before the battle even broke out. On top of that, this model doesn't really produce that much firepower. So when compared to the US six pound cannon, it was at a severe disadvantage. This is a Mexican eight pound field gun. Cannons like this one are nestled amongst the infantry ranks of the Mexican army here at the Battle of Palo Alto. These cannons were pretty heavy and huge that they were mostly gonna be static pieces on the field. So they were gonna be placed in locations that were thought to have the best advantage because they weren't gonna go anywhere after they started the battle. It was gonna take too much effort on their part, the Mexican army, to maneuver them and then have to maneuver them again. So uh, compare that to the US's light artillery that was more mobile uh, these cannons didn't compare. They were made around the mid to late 1700s, uh, so a pretty old design, even in terms of the battle in 1846. Uh, couple that together with the bad black powder of the Mexican army, these cannons didn't have the charge to uh, send the cannonball on, on the other side of the field and hit their, their mark. They either go short or wide of their target and never quite making its proper destination. Uh, so, in conclusion, these cannons, pretty heavy, they've got bad black powder. You pretty much had a tough day ahead of you if you're a Mexican artilleryman. Here, next to this row of flags, we are standing right next to the U.S. battle line. When General Taylor came down with his 2,500 troops, they emerged from this dense brush on the northern end of the field, and they were met with an impressive sight. Lined up in front of them, blocking the road, were the Mexican troops with General Arista forming a roadblock, all ready for battle. Taylor said that the bayonet was the thing, charged with the bayonet, but he soon changed his mind. Seeing that Mexican line stretched out in front of him, he wanted to avoid heavy, heavy casualties. He held his infantry back and rolled his cannon forward. It was easier because of the latest cannon technology, flying artillery. Flying artillery was a new, lightweight, easily moved cannon that could move swiftly flying across the battlefield. Let's take a closer look at the U.S. artillery. Directly behind me is a replica of the U.S. six-pound cannon, also known as the flying artillery. Now the flying artillery were lightweight cannons. Their mobility gave a huge advantage to the U.S. forces. Now the flying artillery was actually a concept developed by Major Samuel Ringgold. This concept had the cannons attached to six horses and they were able to maneuver around the battlefield in a matter of minutes. Now compared to the larger, heavier Mexican cannons that couldn't be pulled by horses, and the Mexican army was at a huge disadvantage. Now, Major Sam Moringo, he actually came up with the idea after going across seas over to Europe and seeing how they developed their artillery tactics. 
Now, unfortunately, Major Ringo was actually struck by a cannonball during this battle. So he only got to see the flying artillery once because after this battle, he would die due to his injuries. However, it's safe to say without Major Sam Ringo and the flying artillery, the war between U.S. and Mexico would have turned out a lot different. In addition to the U.S. 600 light artillery, Zachary Taylor used larger cannons like the one behind me, the U.S. 18-pounder, to strengthen his defenses. This cannon was pulled by teams of oxen, and the cannon tube alone was made out of cast iron and got up to about 5,000 pounds itself. Not to mention the carriage that also goes along with it. So that limited them to mainly being on the old historic road. And because of the immense size, they got to stay a static pieces throughout the entire battle. Uh, with that, that also allowed them to fire these explosive volleys of shot over at the Mexican battle line and rain down chaos on the Mexican army. At the conclusion of the battle, Mexican troops ended up delaying U.S. forces. However, the U.S. had a clear advantage with its artillery. The constant artillery barrage by the U.S. on the Mexican forces inflicted heavy Mexican casualties. At the end of the battle, 102 Mexican soldiers were killed, 129 of them were wounded, and 26 were missing. On the U.S. side, nine soldiers were killed, 44 were wounded, and two were missing. The casualty numbers prompted General Arista to retreat after spending most of the night burying his dead soldiers. He ended up retreating to a site five miles down uh, south of here that is known as Risaca de la Palma. The next day, the U.S. Army would head down to the exact same site where they would clash at the second battle of the U.S.-Mexican War, the Battle of Risaca de la Palma. After the battles on the Rio Grande, soldiers thought the war would end quickly. However, Mexican leaders were willing to fight. They led the U.S. soldiers down through the mountains of northern Mexico onto the beaches of Veracruz and deep into the valley of Mexico. Santa Ana returns to fight. Unfortunately for Mexico, he failed. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ended the war. It resulted in Mexico selling its new Mexico and Upper California territories for $15 million. The United States now extended to the Pacific Ocean. In addition to that vast expanse of land, they gained ports, minerals, natural resources, and places that are now national parks. Mexico suffered national trauma. Political and military leaders struggled to revive the Mexican country and its people. Over the years, U.S. and Mexican relations have changed. There have been strong bonds between the two countries. However, there's still a struggle with distrust and misunderstandings from the war, its effects, and ongoing legacy. Thank you both so much for sharing that video with us and please extend our thanks to your team for creating that. It was really great to see. We appreciate it. Well, thanks. Thanks for uh, giving us this opportunity. Uh, I hope you, you guys enjoyed that. It it's kind of difficult to encompass such uh, an impactful uh, event, a conflict, uh, into a short video. But it, it, you know, as far as the Battle, battle of Palo Alto goes, it, it's a, a, a pretty good example of how different, at this point in history, the, the U.S. And, and Mexico are. Uh, you know, you have uh, in the United States a country that's able to uh, develop its military resources and, and able to fund those properly. Uh, you know, unfortunately for the Mexican government, they're not able to do that. And so, although you have an army here, a Mexican army at the Battle of Palo Alto that vastly outnumbers the U.S. Army by about a thousand troops, because they have that gap in their technology, uh, it's, they're not able to, to take advantage of that. Uh, now, to kind of delve a little bit deeper into what's going on with the Mexican army at this time, 
Uh, I'm going to turn it over to our, our volunteer, Jaime Hernandez here, uh, and, and he'll be talking to you a little bit about that. They didn't mention in the uh, video, this is the first battle that the war actually was declared <clears throat> a couple of weeks before this. The uh, American Army found out that the Mexican Army was crossing the river in force. And about 25 miles up the river from Brownsville, present day Brownsville, was a little ranch called Carricitos. It was more or less thumb shaped with the base of the thumb on the river, surrounded by thicket, very hard to get in and out of. One way in, besides the river. Taylor sent a detachment of dragoons, about 60 of them, to investigate the movement of the Mexican army. They were ambushed by the Mexican army when they went into that ranch. Uh, 16 were killed, uh, including the major Thornton was taken captive, the rest of the Americans were taken captive. When Taylor found out about this, sent a message to President Polk, the president appointed to the uh, Congress, he said uh, that famous statement, American blood has been shed on American soil. That's for a declaration and it was approved. The Mexican army wasn't prepared for any kind of fighting. They had no facilities to make weapons, uniforms, gunpowder. The gunpowder that they had was very poor. Give you an example, the musket that I would be firing on this day, I would have to double load it to have the range. And because it is double loaded, it would knock the soldier back. So the Mexican soldier would put it to his side and fire from there. You're not gonna hit anything. The cannons, powder being so poor, it wouldn't reach the target. They were overload, they were overshoot the American lines. We have reports of the American army, when they see the cannons being fired, say a cannonball rolling towards them, will just open up their ranks, cannonball roll right through. The American army in their hand was firing canister, grape, take out 10 men at a time from the Mexican line. The Mexican army wasn't well trained, but they were brave. They saw this as an insult to the national honor. They did not surrender. They did not retreat from here. We have reports that the Mexican army, when those first 10 or five would fall, the second line would move up and yell, Viva Mexico, and move up to expect the next discharge. We know that because General, later, General Grant, the Civil War, put that in his memos. Now, the Mexican government was, less, was as corrupt then as it is now. An example of that, when the army moved up here to counter Taylor's army, which is in the University of Texas, Brownsville, right behind it are the remains of that fort. The earthen works used to be eight feet high to 10. Now you can go see it, there are about two or three but it's still there, still visible, right across from Matamoros. <clears throat> the Mexican government was under the President Herrera. Give you an example of corruption. From January to November of that same year, 1846, they went through eight presidents. Herrera, through his Minister of War, sent money to a fellow named uh, Paredes, who was supposed to bring the money up here to the border to give it to the Commander General, Arista, to buy supplies and everything. Well, he used it to overthrow the government. So you see that division, like there's no sense of, it's not as an insult to their honor, but do they have honor by doing it? I think not. The Mexican soldier was brave, but not trained. Mexico used what they call la leva, which is like a conscription. Every October, November, they would have a lottery. And whoever gets picked, if you volunteer, you served eight years. If you were drafted, you served 10. They didn't have enough ammunition. 
Yes, ma'am, will you can ask him? Did you have a question, miss? No? Okay. The Mexican army couldn't even practice on their muskets because the, the little amount of powder they had. So they were trained on the march, going up here, and many of the soldiers would fire for the first time their muskets in the battle. A lot of the Mexican soldiers were the lowest of the lowest, called pelados, which would be like the untouchables in India. No respect, they were few hands. A lot of them were Indians, they didn't even speak Spanish. But those are the ones that made up the bulk of the army, the actual fighting men. When they got up here, no training, no use of the bayonet, those are the ones that confronted the American army. Uh, there's been a, the Mexican side sees as an unfair war. Yeah, young Abraham Lincoln said he was one of the most unjust since of American aggression ever because the Mexico was not prepared. On paper, their number was huge, but in actuality, no. They had no training, no weapons, uniforms, they wore one, and that was it. Okay. Uh, so you do have this this stark contrast going on here, where you know it, it's hard to to motivate a, a fighting force, you know, to have them defend the the country, defend the country's honor, uh, when basic things like getting paid uh, or getting fed are are an issue. And so it's you can imagine these soldados are coming up uh, here to engage the U.S. Army going up against what at that point in time was some of the most advanced weapons technology in the world really uh, in the US flying artillery. It's, you know, so they're outmanned, they're, they're as, far as, as far as technology goes, weapons technology, uh, they're under-resourced. Uh, and so it's, it's very difficult as you know, was alluded to in, in the video to, you know, you're, you're on the field, you're in danger, uh, you're putting yourself in danger. You're fighting for a cause which which you think is right and just, but you just don't have the tools available. Uh, you know they're not at your disposal, and so it make th it makes things very difficult to to be standing on that Mexican battle line. And so you have um, you know, what Jaime was alluding to this this kind of this this national tragedy. Uh, you know. I'm thinking, you know, you can even see it just in how the, the war is remembered. It's remembered very differently uh, in the U.S. and, and in Mexico. Uh, I think generally you can say that it's a little bit more well-known in Mexico. Uh, it's still kind of one of the lesser-known conflicts in, in the U.S. For I mean, we, we opened up this visitor center in 2004, and for the first several years, the majority of the people that were coming through the doors here, this was the first time they had ever heard of the U.S.-Mexican War. Uh, luckily, that's that has changed over time, you know, and we like to think that we we played some small part in that, and just you know, educating the, the public or cluing them into this part of of U.S. history that maybe a lot of people didn't know about. But you know, it's just not as well known as it is in Mexico. Uh, how the, the war is remembered. I mean, in general, in the U.S., this is either the, the U.S.-Mexican War or the Mexican War even. In Mexico, this is the North American invasion. And so that, that is really how this is seen. Uh, you have boundaries that are definitely changed after this conflict. But what's kind of kicking off this conflict is a question about boundaries. Uh, you have questions over you know, not just ownership of Texas, but also what is Texas? You know, what defines Texas? And so you have different groups of people claiming different boundary lines. And, and I'm not sure, I can't see anyone who's, who's out there. Uh, if anyone's ever taken art, um, I surprisingly took four years of art <laughs> in middle school and in high school. And one of the first things that you're, you're taught in art is that the line is artificial. That's, that's a man-made thing is to draw a line. And so you, know, you can draw a line on a map or on a piece of paper and say, okay, I'm drawing this line here. 
that's definitely them and this is us. But in reality, it, it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, you know, it, it's just not the way things work. You, know, you have, you know, customs and cultures and languages and, and foods or, you know, whatever may be that are present, you know, in a place, in a territory. And then for someone or a government to come along and say, okay, as of today, we're drawing this line and this is now Texas or this is now the United States. Uh, so this, this is your, your new life. Uh, it's, it, in, in practice, you know, it's, it's not that quick of a change. Uh, and even to, to this day, you know, because of perhaps of how things played out, uh, you had, you know, this transfer of about a million square miles that went from being Mexican territory uh, to, to U.S. territory uh, for, at that time, the price of, of $15 million. Uh, you know, that, that's a big chunk to all of a sudden have be part of your country. What happens is Mexico is essentially cut in half and the U.S. doubles in size. Uh, to have that, that dramatic uh, a change occur and to expect it to be kind of like flipping a switch that all of a sudden, okay, this is definitely not the United States and this is the way things operate. Uh, you know, it just, it's not, it's not practical uh, in, in that sense. And so that kind of still stirs things, you know, whether it be questions about immigration or even, even boundaries or borders that, I mean, th this conflict broke out 175 years ago, uh, but it, it's pretty easy to turn on, you know, local news or, you know, search Twitter or what have you, and to find something that you can almost directly tie to, if not the conflict, the consequences of the conflict. Uh, and so it, it's something that's still quite definitely re resonating uh, today. Uh, working here, I've, I've kind of heard all kinds of different uh, opinions or feelings about, about this conflict uh, from people in the States, from other countries, uh, from Mexico. A lot of times people will, will ask us, you know, how, you know, do people in Mexico feel? And of course, you don't want to speak for, for everyone. And so, you know, you pick out, you know, some examples that I've personally uh, been a part of and experienced. And, you know, they, they run the gamut from, you know, very early on from when we opened the visitor center here, had a gentleman uh, who came in and said that his brother, who still lives in Mexico, will only come as far north as Matamoros, which is the city directly across from, from Brownsville here, here on the border. And he says he only comes up this far because he says that there's where it started, there being Brownsville. He says, so I, I will not step foot in Brownsville. So, and that, that's a very recent uh, opinion, very strongly held by someone, uh, to ranging all the way to, I had uh, some, some teachers here uh, some time back from, from Saltillo, which is in Northern Mexico. And this one gentleman says that, you know, the U.S. should have just kept it all. He's like, I would have been so much better off, you know, because I would have been living in the U.S. And so it, it's, it's kind of strange, you know, living here to, you know, put yourself in, in that headspace that like, wow, you know, that you really can't play you know, all these what if games, you know, where, where would we as, as the country be, uh, where would we be if General Taylor was not successful here at Palo Alto and things played out, you know, differently, or if you did have the acquisition of all this territory, but it had not come as a result of war and maybe occurred through diplomatic channels, would present day U.S.-Mexico relations be different or how they would be different? Um, I mean, you've got four future presidents present on this field about a half mile from me, where me and Heimer are sitting right now. Zachary Taylor becomes president right after this conflict, kind of rides the, the wave of the war hero uh, all the way into the White House. Uh, you have a very young second lieutenant, Ulysses S. Grant, who's present here uh, on the Mexican side of the battlefield. 
Uh, you have General Arista, who goes on to become and, and serve a term as, as president. One of his junior officers, uh, Romulo, uh, Romulo Diaz de la Vega, also serves the term as president. And so, I mean, even bringing it down to, to, to that is, what if one cannonball decided to go just a different way and now you, you completely alter uh, either U.S. or Mexican history? And so it's, it's, it's neat to me, you know, when I, when I start talking to people and that when you, when you look at the battle itself, it's a relatively small engagement. You know, if you compare it to some of these Civil War battlefields, this thing is tiny. I mean, altogether, counting both, both sides, U.S. and Mexican troops, you're barely hitting about 6,000 people that were involved in, in, this, in this battle. Uh, and this relatively small group of people kick off these series of events that go on to really alter the way the U.S. and Mexico went on to, to develop their, you know, their futures, really, their histories. You have these two countries that go on, on two very different paths of, of development. Uh, you have this westward you know, expansion and boom happen in the U.S. In Mexico, you kind of have this cycle of, of political instability and, and revolution. Uh, and really up until recently that you know some make the argument that they're mexico's barely trying to get its its feet you know un, under itself uh, and to think that you know at such a small place with you know a few people that this can happen is 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 pre pretty impactful when you're standing out there on the field and with that unless i have something else uh, we're open. To think about it. And thank you both so much for sharing your insight. We do have some questions if you don't questions, mind. If you don't. Sure. With that. Great. And helping us today uh, with the Q&A session, we have a former National History Academy student, uh, Ben Kellerhals, who is a current TA with our program, and he's a junior at the University of Arizona and an aspiring historian. So Ben, thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, well, it was great to be here. Um, and so, yeah, we have a lot of interesting questions and a lot of interesting thoughts. I myself have grown up in Arizona, so this notion of Mexican-American relations is really feel central to my experiences. Um, let's see here. Uh, we have a, we had a question if there were any other, like there's a canon replicas. Are there any other replica artifacts or real artifacts that you guys preserve and promote? Yes, um, in, in our exhibit area, um, we, we do have actual artifacts that, that were taken from, from the field. Uh, because of the type of, of battle that this was, which is namely an, an artillery duel, that's the bulk of what we find out there uh, are either old specimens or fragments of, of artillery shells. But sometimes there, there's these things that, you know, really kind of bring the battle, the battle field really to life. You know, things like, you know, buttons, you know, off of uniform, uh, money in the form of coins. Uh, there was a, a portion of, of a clay uh, smoking pipe that, that was found. Uh, do, so we do find things of that nature. Uh, but, but for the most part, what we find out there is, um, is artillery rounds. Uh, now the, the cannon replicas that we show uh, in the video and we have out here on the field, uh, those are, you know, built to spec. And so if you were to, you know, I guess be lucky enough to have some kind of time machine and, and go back to 1846, you know, you would be looking at essentially the same thing, you know, everything down to, to the paint schemes. Of course, the material is a little bit different, but the design itself is exactly as it would have been in 1846. Wow. So I guess we have some things that build off of that. Um, what kind of discoveries at the battlefield have, have changed your understanding of the battle? Okay, uh, well, uh, one that happened fairly soon after we opened is, you know, based on the, the archaeology that had been done, we had an idea of where the battle lines lined up or, you know, where they kind of sat on the field, uh, but it was through through more research that we kind of discovered that, well, you know, we were slightly off. And so we actually 
have moved the the placement or the initial placement of the Mexican battle line up, uh, so not substantially so, but, but but enough to make a difference. Uh, and so that was one one thing that we discovered. Uh, the other one was through through research that was done by our our former chief historian. It was that the and we me and Jaime talk about this quite a bit is that the battle was actually not supposed to take place where it, where it ended up taking place. Uh, it, it was the, the uh, initial strategy of the Mexican army to go and meet the U.S. Army as it was coming out of this dense tree line, which makes sense. You know, you don't want them to, to deploy and be ready for battle. Uh, unfortunately for the Mexican army, they had sent their, their, kept their mounted troops or cavalry up there but they had no infantry support. Uh, so they had to kind of pull back. And so that was kind of interesting in that this, this whole time we were kind of thinking, okay, this site was chosen specifically to have the battle this way. When in reality, well, no, it was kind of a, a missed opportunity to engage the U.S. Army at a different location, which would have been a lot more advantageous to the, US, to the Mexican Army. Uh, and it just ended up happening to take place where, where it ended up taking place. Wow, yeah. It's always more messy than it seems at first. Um, <laughs> uh, so I guess also in that same vein, someone asked, what work goes into preserving the battlefield today? Uh, recently, uh, it's focused a lot on the vegetation and the, what we call it the cultural landscape out there. And so, I mean, when, when did you start coming out? I mean, 10 years. About 10 years ago. If you were to look out at the battlefield, and we used to comment on this all the time, there was like a mesquite tree forest growing out there, uh, which obviously was not there at the time of the battle because they wouldn't have chosen that spot. Uh, and so that, that type of, I guess, encroachment on the battlefield came about through activities that occurred after uh, the battle took place and after this whole area started getting developed. And that was namely cattle ranching. Uh, cattle are great at spreading mesquite um, and also things like prickly pear cactus. And so it really took several years through different research projects and I'm sorry, resource projects to get the battlefield restored more to what it would have looked like in 1846. Uh, the next big push, and that's what we think will we'll really get it back to that state, is to have a, a controlled burn of, of the field. And that, Honestly, that, that's really what it takes um, to, to get rid of uh, vegetation that you know doesn't belong there, is you really do have to burn the field, and then what's coming back is, is, should be what was historically there. Interesting. We, I think that ties into what you started to mention about Americans' lack of consciousness about this conflict, because at other sites that we go to, say, like Antietam, they have, there's a lot more remembrance, a lot more discussion, and probably a lot more resources to do that kind of work that you're describing to maintain. Why, we had some questions about why do you think that is? Like, why is it that Americans don't know more about or think more about this conflict? Um, I mean, it's something that, that's come up in, in discussion a lot, but it, it seems to be almost like usually if you're on the losing end of, of a conflict, whatever it be, um, where there be an argument with that you have with someone or what have you, it tends to stick with you a little bit more. Uh, I'm not sure if Jaime can, can speak to that. Some, um, in my opinion, it's because not the United States is ashamed of that war, but maybe a little bit because they knew it was unjust. They knew it wasn't a fair fight. They, they went through the process of trying to buy Texas, but the Mexico knew that it was just a way to grab their land. Because Mexico turned all the offers down. That's my opinion. It, it could be. I mean, you, you do have people like, like Grant and, and Lincoln that they're putting in their in their memoirs and their writings that um, you know, essentially if you take the for for instance, Grant writing in his memoirs that this was it's essentially a northern neighbor taking advantage of, of a southern neighbor that they knew they, they could outpower, um, that they held economic 
uh, advantages over, uh, you know, and so right then and there, I guess, and within recent memory of, of the conflict, you do have more of what, what, what Jaime was talking about a little bit is maybe some of the shame that, that kind of lingers. Uh, but, you know, as time passes, you know, it's just assumed. I mean, I, I went to high school a couple hundred yards away from the battle that took place the, the, the day after the battle follow-up. And, you know, go, going to school there, I, I kind of knew something had happened in the area. I, I didn't know who was involved, what conflict it was. Uh, the way the, uh, the history textbooks were written, the Texas history textbooks, uh, you know, you had, you know, all the way, let's say even through pre-Columbian Texas, all the way through the battles for Texas independence, and it would seem like the, the chapter would end there, and then when the next chapter would pick up, it's, it's the eve of the Civil War already, and if anything, there would be a paragraph or two you're like, oh, by the way, you know, this and this happened in between, and we acquired this part of this territory from Mexico. And so it's just something that was, even, even as, as, as a student, the emphasis was not there. Why the emphasis was not there, I guess that's, that's open to debate. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think a lot of it has to do with on what side of the conflict uh, uh, the country came out on, which is, I think, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's remembered accurately in Mexico. Um, you know, I can't speak to that, but my experience has been that it's at least a little bit more well-remembered uh, in Mexico. And from the memoirs of General Grant, he did write that, uh, we aren't here to prevent a war. We're here to provide an opportunity for it to start, but it's essential that Mexico starts it. Interesting, and that's obviously a pattern that sort of plays out again and again in U.S. history. Um, I, I can speak like briefly in there in Arizona, even at, at the high school level, in advanced history courses, all that the Mexican American War was was uh, the U.S. breezing through to Mexico City. Like, there's not much um, empathy or detail or nuance given to the conflict whatsoever, especially as you mentioned how it relates to Mexican American relations today. Um, let's see. Uh, we have a question. Are there soldier accounts from the battle at the site and how have those played a role in the development oh, of what quite, you guys talked about? Quite a few, actually. Um, those, the, yeah, yeah, those tend to be more accounts from uh, officers, um, as, as was the case. You know, very few privates, if, if, they, if they were literate and could read, read and write, uh, you know, Keeping a diary uh, was an expensive proposition. You know, paper is expensive. You know, supplies are expensive. Uh, but there are, you know, numerous accounts uh, from both armies. You know, uh, Mexican and U.S. Uh, officers, and they they're they're a great tool uh, in that. You know, they kind of help you paint this picture. And for the most part, they are in I wouldn't say complete agreement, but they they, they paint kind of a cohesive picture. Uh, where things get a little muddy or let's say like in casualties, right? Uh, you'll have, you know, and it, it kind of makes sense, you know, if, if you're a Mexican officer, you don't want to outright claim that, you know, you lost 300, 300 soldiers, uh, you know, so some, some vagueness exists there. But as far as how things played out uh, and who was involved, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty, pretty spot on. Uh, luckily, I mean, for us, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is available now because copyrights have expired. Uh, there, there's a ton, a ton of stuff that, that's out there, you know, for, for download. And it's, it's kind of interesting to, to read, not just the official accounts. I kind of like reading a little bit more uh, the letters to home or the diary entries um, or just things that sprung from, from this conflict, uh, the poems, uh, the songs. Uh, they are written, uh, inspired by, by the, the battles and, and, and the deeds during this war. Yeah, that sounds, yeah, really interesting. Um, let's see, we have sort of going off of the, what you were talking about, the political relationship between Americans and Mexicans um, having to do with this conflict. What were the views of Mexicans 
from Americans or vice versa? And how do those impact this conflict? Sure. The Mexicans, at the end, they saw it as a, an invasion of the land, American aggression. Uh, after the Battle of the Alamo, it's about 10 years before this war began. Alamo was in 1836, started 1846. Uh, the Mexicans never recognized Texas as being independent. And if they did, it certainly wasn't the border of the Rio Grande. It was the Nueces River in a zigzag pattern up to the Red River. Any attempt at the United States to take that land would be seen as an aggression, aggression and an act of war. So when General Taylor moved his army south in the Nueces, it was Rio Grande, the Rio Grande River in Brownsville, that was to them an act of war, if not a declaration of war. Yeah, and you know, you have um, two very different uh, viewpoints here because, you know, initially before the conflict officially breaks out, uh, you have, you know, these, these, these diplomatic overtures that are being made by, by the U.S. government, by President Polk. And, you know, in, in his mind, you know, it's coming across like this is just a, a simple business transaction. You know, it, it makes sense, you know, to him that Mexico would want to sell uh, this upper California, New Mexico territory to the U.S. because he knows, you know, word, word travels, there is news that's available. He knows that they can't afford to, to, to maintain it. And so his, his, I guess his line, his hook is like, well, you know, I know that you can't afford to keep it, just sell it to us. And, you know, if, if you're in the Mexican government, uh, especially a, 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 an elected official or, the, you know, <laughs> the president, yeah, there, there is no way, even, even if it made total sense to you to do that, it, there is no way that they were going to agree to even host those talks because to, as the second that they did that, you know, they'd be a traitor to the country, their political career is over, there is just, there's just no way. And so you have, you know, the U.S. coming at it from, you know, let's make a deal essentially and Mexican government not willing to talk to anyone at all because the minute that they acknowledge or you know, even entertain the idea that they would talk to a, a representative of the U.S. government, you know, in their eyes, well, that's going to look like we're, we're giving in and we're going to just cater to their demands. And so there's, it's, it's almost, you, you hate to say that something's inevitable, but, you know, if that can't happen, and for, for valid reasons, I, I think on both sides, if that can't happen, well, then how is this going to get settled? You know, in, in Polk's eyes, the way that this settles is you put a U.S. Army right on the border of what he believes is this newly added state of Texas, looking directly across the river at a Mexican army who is there defending what they believe is a Mexican river to expel a U.S. force that they believe is at least 150 miles into Mexico, you know, something's going to happen. It's just going to, it's going to spill over. Yeah. So we have some questions from Facebook. I think that uh, some more questions from Facebook that I think go together. So someone asks if you know of any of the work being done to publish Mexican accounts of this battle or the war in general, but also a question, um, what is a good beginner book for a history of this conflict? I think those sort of go together. Um, we, I mean, we've had not the best of luck <laughs> trying to find, um, you know, resources, you know, outside of uh, the usual like eight or 10 that we come across for, for I guess the Mexican viewpoint of this particular conflict, especially one that's written uh, either during the conflict or, or shortly thereafter. Uh, you know, could there be some out there? I'm sure there are. Um, there's just not, and at least in our experience, easy to come by. Uh, you almost have to really be physically in Mexico, down in the archives, either in Mexico City or let's say a city like Monterrey, um, 
to, to, to visit these sites. Uh, and so, you know, unfortunately that, that's a little bit harder. I'm not saying it's impossible, but they're a little bit harder to come by. And so we get kind of excited whenever we come across something that, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't know of before. Um, as far as a, a beginner, <laughs> a beginner book for the U.S.-Mexican War, uh, you know, there, there's two out there that kind of encompass the, the whole thing uh, quite well. Uh, you, you have a, a book, you know, not surprisingly titled The, the Mexican War. Uh, and the author is, is Jack Bauer. Um, that, that's one uh, that's kind of like this survey, survey type book. You have another one that's similar. Uh, it's called uh, So Far From God uh, by John Eisenhower, uh, which is another, another survey book, which is a play off of, uh, I think it's Juarez, Benito Juarez, uh, you know, the famous line. And it kind of, it fits with this, with this, with this conflict and, and this feeling uh, that many in Mexico had, you know, about, about what's going on was, you know, poor Mexico, you know, so far from God and so close to the United States. You know, that's, that's kind of the feeling there. But those, those are the two books that I guess would be service intro books. Uh, luckily, over the past, I would say like five or six years, there's been a few more, few more uh, titles added, added to the list. Some of them are a little bit more specialized, but as far as general survey books, those, those, those aren't too, too bad. Great. Yeah. yeah. I have relatives in Mexico, and I've asked them to look up some of the books in Spanish. I can read some Spanish, but he hasn't been successful. The only one that I was able to buy in Matamoros was the Mexican view of the Battle of the Alamo or the Texas campaign. That's the only one. And so we found out what the Mexican social actually went to, and I doubt that it changed a lot. From 1836 to 1846, their rations, lack of uniforms, lack of everything. That's the only one that I've been able to find. I'm a retired school teacher, history school teacher, and I've tried to prepare myself right to do presentations here. Hmm. Well, I think we have, I think we have, looks like two more questions. Well, the first one being sort of going off of what you guys have just answered, how do you feel that Hispanic Heritage Month, your site, the, the recent maybe trend, so you could call it, in history to tell more stories that have been downplayed. Is that working? Or are more Americans becoming conscious of this conflict, Hispanic heritage in general? Uh, I'm sorry to say, I think more people are apathetic. They don't really want to know it. Uh, I taught for 29 years, high school students. Most of them didn't really care. Their attitude was, we we'll have to learn about dead people like that. So a lot of people are apathetic. I'm sure there's somebody that does want to know. Uh, unfortunately, I think it creates uh, resentment, anger. They didn't know this happened. But when they do find out, they kind of see it as, hey, maybe the United States was aggressive. Like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough because, um, you know, on, on the one hand, you know, you want, you want to kind of stir these conversations up, you know, even if they do lead in, into, you know, a little bit of, you know, uh, let's say anger or, or what have you, uh, you know, and so in, in that respect, you know, I, I would say that I think we're, we're kind of doing our job, so to speak, a little bit uh, better, more so in the past five or six years. Uh, but you know, as I said before, when we first opened, there was not there was a lot of what what Heim was alluding to here. A lot of this apathy is like, okay, it's not it's not a thing. You know, it's not just something that's common knowledge. Everyone that was coming through the doors was very well uh, uh, familiar with the U.S. Civil War or even the battles for Texas independence, uh, because you know, that, that's just something that's, I guess, general knowledge by this point. Uh, but as far as this conflict, and I think that's when you get into these, uh, these, these themes and these stories that are a little bit sticky. You know, they're, 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 not, they're not clean. There's, there's no clear cut good guy and bad guy 
you know, here you have, you know, uh, maneuvers and, and motives and, and aspirations uh, by people in both governments, both armies uh, that, you know, kind of paint them with not so much a black and white brush, but more of a gray, more of a gray brush. Uh, but, you know, luckily, you know, I think we're hopefully kind of getting into, into a place where we can at least bring the knowledge to, to the public, you know, have them make, make up their minds. Uh, but it's, it's taken a while, a while to get there. I mean, people would come to living history programs and the first half of the program was just getting them up to speed on what this conflict was, because it's just not something that's, that's part, part of their library, not, not part of their history library or, or what they know. And hopefully once they do get, get into it, you know, slightly, it, it'll, you know, my hope is that it'll get them to ask questions or at least kind of start to think, it's like, okay, well, I may not necessarily agree on this particular viewpoint in, in, in whatever that may be on U.S.-Mexican relations, but at least I, I get why that person feels that way. Because of this, it happened, you know, hopefully, because of this, it happened in 1846, you know, or, or concluded in 48. It's like, okay, I, I get where that person's coming from now, uh, where I, I don't think that was really happening, you know, 10, 10 years ago. Mm. Yeah. Um, so we always like to ask, or we have always have some students who want to know, how did you two get where you are in your career? And maybe what advice would you have for young people that are trying to get into history or that do care about this stuff? Yeah. Sure. I mean, uh, when I graduated high school, I always liked this all kinds of history. Um, when I started teaching, actually I went into it not so much to teach, but because I wanted to coach. But once I started teaching, and that was something I loved, I really got into it. I actually taught. I wasn't the type of coach that, okay, <clears throat> read the chapter, get a question at the end of the chapter. No, I actually lecture. I actually took field trips. I actually did things that you're supposed to do as a teacher. And uh, I just loved it. When I heard about this and doing reenactments here in Texas, I jumped at the opportunity. I, this is all mine. I had it made for me. So I wanted it to, I wanted it to be as authentic as possible. And to Danny and the bar, I found out how the uniform really looked like and things like that. I taught for 29 years. I retired about 10 years ago, and I'm still doing this. I still read a lot, still try to expand, know about smaller details about this battle, because we represent, I'm the commander of the Mexican army here, and I want to be able to give actual facts, not just speculation, or it might have been this way, I want actual facts. Trying to get the ones from Mexico are very extremely hard. But the ones we read here, I put out. I, I kind of came about it in a roundabout way. <laughs> I, was, I was a student at the local university, and I was uh, originally, unbeknownst to him, I, I was going to follow in Jaime's footsteps and, and become a history teacher. And so uh, I, got, I got word that they were looking for a student uh, employee, so I started working at the park, and it, it, it just it, it fit for me. You know, I, I had history there because – of my love for history, but being an, an interpretation, I got exposed to this whole other world of, of storytelling and the, the impact that telling stories and sharing stories with, with people, um, you know, how that really can, can affect somebody's life or at least their day. You know, they'll, they'll come in through the door. I, I don't know who I'm getting that day. It could be somebody from across town or, you know, on the other side of the map. And to be able to, to share a story, you know, to kind of get at what specifically brought them to our site, you know, whatever that may be, and to kind of share, share the stories of, of what Palo Alto is, you know, what, what it represents, um, what, what it can represent to, to other people. And to kind of see them, you know, kind of, 
take that in and kind of make it their own. Um, that that's really where recently that that's been my I guess my joy so to speak. And so I came in as a student, uh, was was lucky enough to stay in um, after graduation, and have kind of uh, you know been been relying on on people like like Jaime, our, our great volunteer. Um, group that we have here, a great group of rangers, uh, to kind of build build on this place and, and what it can what it can provide to people. Thank you so much for sharing. And Ben, great job with the Q and A as always. Thank you for being with us. And Jaime and Daniel, thank you so much. Your passion for history was really evident and we're grateful to have you with us here today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. And thank you everyone at home for tuning in. I will be back tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. as we continue our Hispanic Heritage Month programming with a panel discussion with NPS superintendents. So hopefully see you there and everyone have a wonderful rest of your day.